Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another live episode of Let's Talk on your favorite channel, Huda TV. I'm your host, Arkham Rashid. In this episode, we will discuss how the Quran has affected our lives. So let's start off by welcoming our wonderful guest. Our brother on my right hand side, if you can give us your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Bilal Abdullah. I live, work, and study in the great country of Egypt, and I'm happy to be with you once again here on uh, Let's Talk. And we're always happy to have you on, Bilal Abdullah. Thank you. Uh, brother, next time, if we can get your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. I'm Omar Khaldun from Egypt, and I work as a part time translator. And I'm always, yeah, I always enjoy being here. <laughs> and it's always wonderful having you on Thank as you well. Thank you so much. Uh, brother, on this side, can you give us your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself? Go ahead, uh, my name is Idris, and I'm from America. I'm living here in Egypt, studying and teaching English at the same time. All right, Idris, mm -hmm. once again, it's wonderful you know, having you on the show, having these conversations with you uh, almost at a weekly basis. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, brother, next to him, if you can uh, give us your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ilyas Townsend. I'm from London. And I'm uh, here in Egypt with my children, just trying to benefit all around, inshallah. All right, inshallah. It's wonderful having you on as well. Uh, so usually we gather here every week and we have a topic to discuss. And, you know, we have a wonderful conversation and it usually ends before we even notice it. So let's start off with a, a simple question. How did the Quran affect your life? Bilal, if you can start us off, inshallah. Mm, what a wonderful question this is. <laughs> um, how has it been called and affected my life? Well, personally, the Quran is, has a, a, such a, a smooth, calming uh, effect when, you, when listening to it. And for those who don't know Arabic, you know, you, you listen to it and you're thinking, okay, what does this mean? So it drives you to learn the Arabic language and to understand its meanings and to, and to ponder it. It's something for me that when I was in my youth, I was really into music, and the Quran has, has replaced that with something better. The, the Quran itself has given me a better message, a positive message, something to hold on to, to uh, something positive to share with others. Uh, it's something that when you're constantly thinking about it, um, it's, uh, it reforms your life and puts you on the right step if you're paying attention to it. You know, for some people, the Quran is like, background noise or ambiance, right? If you go to certain grocery stores and you just hear it, you kind of ignore it, like it's elevator music. But uh, that's not the way it should be treated, you know. It's something that is, uh, is special and it's caused many people, those who don't know Arabic, to either become Muslim or think about Islam just because of, of listening to it. So for me, it's, it's had a very um, positive effect and, and I enjoy it. Very interesting. Uh, brother, next time if you can share how the Quran has affected you. The most effective thing for me about the Quran is that it answers all the existential questions, <coughs> all the important questions about life. Where am I going? What's important about life? So what's the meaning of life? And without all of these things, if they are left unanswered, like in many, many civilizations, they don't have these answers, and maybe they ignore them by just maybe uh, just trying to focus on materialistic stuff and don't focus on answering these questions. So Quran answers these questions and makes you feel that you are having a meaningful life and, having, and you have a lo logical answers to these questions. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, I mean, that put a question in my mind, but I'm going to save that right after you guys give me your opinion on, or not your opinion, or actually your thoughts and how the Quran has <coughs> actually affected you. Um, for me, it's a, sort of an interesting story because, believe it or not, I actually accepted Islam bef before actually reading any Qur'an or hearing any Qur'an. I never heard it and never heard anything. Mm -hmm. I became Muslim before I even heard it. So for me, the Qur'an was uh, like a, a second coming of, you know, awakening for me. The first was actually accepting Islam. The second was when I started to listen and, and read Qur'an, it was more like uh, seeing true wisdom, you know, unfold before your eyes. That feeling of like, wow, like this is 
absolutely amazing. Uh, and, 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 and when you actually implement things, sometimes you don't understand them. And then Allah shows you, usually if you're patient, the wisdom behind it. Not always, but sometimes you find this, and, you, and when that wisdom hits you, it's amazing. For me, it's, it's a, it was a life-changing event for me. Mm. Actually starting, and then even more, when I started learning in Arabic, it just takes it to a, a whole other level, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, we would get into the story uh, behind your conversion and stuff, inshallah. Oh. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we'll say that for another well, episode. I was just thinking that sounds interesting, that how he said. Mm. I, I really want to hear that myself. Yeah, me, me too. <laughs> After, you know, go ahead. For you, you, you sparked an interest in all of the all of the the whole panel here. Everybody <laughs> wants to hear what you have to say there, inshallah. Okay, we can save it for another time, inshallah. But somebody remind him of that story, inshallah. inshallah. And yes, we can we can move on to you, Dias. Um, how do you think the Quran has affected your life? Um, I'm slightly different to Idris, but at the same time similar. Um, the Quran played a big role in me accepting Islam. Um, I never heard it in Arabic until I became also my, I believe, I believe I heard it in Arabic afterwards, but I tried to read the translation. So before I became a Muslim, coming from a Christian background, there came a point in my life when I wanted to make a positive change and try to do something meaningful and worthwhile that would hopefully secure my afterlife, because I mean, that was the big motivation in me accepting Islam. So um, I was raised in a Christian home. So when it came that time and I'd done a bit of research and on world religions and decided that it was either Islam or remaining a Christian, I would read, try to spend maybe an hour a day, to the best of my ability, reading half an hour of the Bible and half an hour of the Quran. And um, there just came a point where I was just not interested in, you know, it sounds <laughs> slightly negative, but I didn't, wasn't interested in what the Bible was telling me. You know, it just felt like stories, you know, whereas the Qur'an, it actually felt like Allah was talking to me as an individual. So, you know, I had like a personal relationship with it. Mm -hmm. And um, it soon became, you know, 45 minutes of the Qur'an and 15 minutes of the Bible, you know, you try and give it a little, you know, try give it a chance, but then eventually, <laughs> eventually it's just, the, it's like as soon as I read it, uh, my heart was just open to, to Islam. And since that time, even before I was a Muslim, I had uh, uh, a copy of the Qur'an I was reading and um, just learning a little bit of Arabic and listening to it in Arabic is completely, it's different. There's no, even if you don't understand what it's, even if you don't understand, understand what it means, like the feeling you get just from listening to it in Arabic language is, it just brings a, a softness and tranquility to your heart that it, it's, you could listen to the music for days on end, you never have that same feeling, that feeling of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So really uh, since that time of me becoming a Muslim, I've tried to follow the Qur'an, what the, what the rulings and prohibitions, etc. to the best of my ability, I'm, the, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's had a great impact mm -hmm. uh, on my life in all aspects, the way um, I speak, the way I carry myself, mm -hmm. it just goes hand in hand with Islam, obviously, and has this had a profound effect on me. Yeah. Uh, well, before I actually ask my next question, I just wanted to comment that uh, Elias, when he was speaking right now, that was one of those um, humming yeah. Nasheed moments. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's going to somebody's gonna cut his answer and then put it into the... You know those, those videos they have on YouTube when yeah. the speaker's speaking, they have the Nasheed in the background. <laughs> and then Elias is talking like, and I was reading 30 minutes a day <laughs> to the Bible. <laughs> it's one of those moments. Oh, look, if they advertise on YouTube, I want some of that cut as well, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, basically what I've, uh, obviously we all believe that the Quran, you can extract from it for your daily lives in terms of ritualistic practices, in terms of social practices, in any aspect of your life. But the question is, do you actually extract it? do you actually extract from the Qur'an when it comes to your social life? Now we know we take prayers and fasting and, and what's haram from the Qur'an. But wh what about when it comes to your behavior with people? What about, do we actually look at the Qur'an and extract from the Qur'an and follow the lessons that are in the Qur'an from this? So we'll start off with, uh, do we actually extract it personally? And why do we think people won't extract mm -hmm. it? Or why is there a lack of, of, of extracting social rulings from the Qur'an and just ri ritualistic rulings, right? Uh, Bilal, let's start with you, inshallah. 
What a massive question it is. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, the, the Quran is, it has a lot to say about our behavior as people, and the Quran also points to the Sunnah, to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that goes hand in hand. Um, you know, I, I, I try to the best of my ability to use the Quran to shape my behavior. I, I fall short. You know, if I gave myself a scorecard, I, I may say I'm 50-50. Today I may be 30-70. I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, but my heart is in the right place. But yeah, I, 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 when you read the Quran, it is telling you how to be as a person. Like I think, if someone can remind me, there's an ayah in Surah Al Hujurat is talking about uh, name calling of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking about one group was don't don't do not um, sp have a bad name for yeah. for another group because it may be that they are better than you, better than you know. Well, it's very easy as a human being to feel arrogant for some reason over another person because of your skin color, mm -hmm. your nationality, and what your passport says, your money, maybe your intelligence or your perceived intelligence or whatever the case may be. It's very easy for the son of man to slip into arrogance, you know. And so I, I try to remember what Allah has said in regards to my behavior while at the same time falling short. I think we can extract from the Quran how to be better people and how to treat others better because it's part of our dawah you know you don't have to say hey be Muslim mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. people come and say hey I noticed that you're you're not like everyone else at, at the office what is different about you man were you raised like this or that and you explain to the person no I'm Muslim and the Quran says this and that what's the Quran and it goes on from there mm -hmm. right um, unfortunately not all of us are, are like that but the attempt is there, and yes, we can extract how to be better people uh, um, from the Quran. Yeah, and, and I think actions are probably the best way to preach your religion to anybody. I mean, we have brothers that, for example, um, have a friend who doesn't attend the Christmas parties at his school that he works in. And, you know, people might ask him, like, you know, wh yeah. why are you sitting in the corner on your phone? Why aren't you joining us for the Christmas party? But, you know, <laughs> this is a form of da'wah. Then he can speak to them and tell them, like, you know, this is what happens in the religion of Islam. This is how we do things. But this is a form of da'wah in itself, just by a simple act of, you know, not attending the Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> the second, the second I tried, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second part of the question we'll save for uh, after we go through everybody's thoughts, which was, why do you think people don't extract their social, uh, the social aspect of their life from the Qur'an. That, that part will save. So uh, Umar, if we can go to you. This part is not to be answered. You can if you want. Yeah. Okay. So I want actually, actually to answer sure, this. Sure, of course. <laughs> I, think, I think the first point for people who are driven away from Qur'an is the way we deal with the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. I think, maybe it's going to be shocking what I'm going to say, but the only book on earth that people read without understanding is Qur'an. Nobody on earth can read a book and you can ask him, are you going to read this book by understanding or not understanding? But we do this with the Quran. We do this maybe in Ramadan, for instance. I want it's to the first time I actually thought about that as well. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. There's, there's no other book that somebody, you know, you don't ask some, somebody, that, oh, do you understand Arabic? <laughs> Like yeah. if, if somebody's reading an English book, you're going to say, do you understand English? He's not reading the book. No, that's, that's, that's not true, though. The same thing with the Bible. Hmm. The same thing with the Bible. Yeah. You know. No, maybe not on the level but, of the Quran. But at least the Bible's in the language you understand. You don't find, for example, Italians reading in the English Bible. Well, the problem is, especially in African American communities, uh, there, and, and also Caucasian as well, but I'm African American, so I'm speaking from that perspective. Um, they, is, is a, very, a very high value is placed on the King James Version of the Bible. Yeah. And so the English is very that. old English, and people don't readily understand it. You know, and, and and it's also a big problem. But they understand the words that are on the paper. They just mm -hmm. don't understand what was meant and what's being conveyed. Uh, but they, they know, they like if they read, picture. thou shalt not kill, they know that it means don't kill. Mm -hmm. But if I read it in Hindi, I have no idea what I'm saying. Yes. But there's another Well, I've, I've met people who are on both sides of the day. Some, they say they read it and you understand, and it's others who don't. Because some verses are very tricky to read, even in the Bible in Old English. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, think yeah, sure. I think what Arkham is getting at here is a person would learn how to read Arabic, can read the Quran and not understand any... Mm -hmm. exactly. Or not much. You can not understand anything. Now, there's, right. that's that's not what there's, there's something very important that we need to <laughs> remind the viewers and mention to the viewers and make sure that we clarify this point is that 
not to stop reading the Quran just oh, because no, you don't no. understand it. Because the Quran itself, just by reading it, it's a, a, an act of worship. So unlike other books, whereas just by reading it, it won't be an act of worship. But just the words in the Quran, because they're the words of God, just by recitation of the words, you get reward. And you, we all know the hadith of the Prophet where he said, each letter that you read of the Quran, you get tenfold of reward. So let's not forget this part that it's, obviously it's very important to understand what we're reading and what we're reciting, but at the same time, to not let go of the Qur'an and to not recite just because we don't understand it. Because there is war, reward in reciting ju- uh, without even understanding it. And this is, not only, not only do you get reward, but this is, you have to do it. You have to recite Qur'an. So whether or not you understand Surah Fatiha or not, you have to recite it in your prayer. It's not, it's not okay, I don't understand Surah Fatiha, I'm going to read it in English in my prayer. This doesn't, be it doesn't work like that. This, this, yeah, of exactly. course, that's, where, yeah. that's what we're getting at. <laughs> Meaning, t- in order for you to extract social aspects of your life and just more than what's halal and what's haram just more than the basic understanding of every single Muslim this is where it comes in that you need to understand the language of the Quran you need to understand the language that God has sent his rules in uh, I'm gonna let you continue over before I, I you know take more of your time go ahead <laughs> yeah, no, actually I said most of what I want to say that um, that we don't focus on the meaning and I don't mean that we have to read all the time tafsir and interpretations all the time and we of course that's important but we have to leave for ourselves a point of contemplation. Like, I think for myself, and I heard this from some of the, the scholars, that every chapter in the Quran, every surah, has a certain message. Maybe you can think that the beginning of the surah and in the middle, in the beginning maybe Allah is saying rules, and in the middle there is a story of one of the prophets, and in the end maybe something related to the orders to the prophet to do certain things. You can think that they are not, unt- they are not related, but for me, I think that... that the role of the one who is reading the Qur'an is to have the link between all of these um, mm-hmm. verses in the, in the, in the surah. I, I don't mean for people to go and make up stuff, but I mean yeah, that the most important thing, yes, Qur'an talks to our logic, but this is not the only thing. Qur'an also talks to our emotions because we are human beings. We, have, we also ha- you know, you have to love something in order to mm-hmm. go and, and apply <coughs> what it tells you. So this is what I want to see. All right, I'm going to move over to this side. Uh, Idris, uh, some of your thoughts on this, and then we'll ask Elias as well. Yeah, uh, as, as regards to the first point, um, for me, it's I implement a lot, and you know, a lot of from the Quran in, in, in my personal behavior. Mashallah, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that it's not that I'm conscious of doing it, but it's been over a time, a period of doing it. New Muslims don't do it because it's not something that they're used to and they're going to do a big change and but over time it was because of my teacher um Sheikh Jafar Idris shout out okay. so <laughs> yeah so he <laughs> taught me a, a lot of tarbiyah you know and over time it became something that you realize and you and it affects you and you when it, something happens you may want to act a certain way but the Quran or something that pulls you back and says uh uh-uh, don't do that yeah. So it's, it, it, and you know why. So this is sort of how you implement, you know, the things from the Quran in, in your life. Especially for me, because before I was Muslim, I was a completely different person. I mean, not very good person at all. <laughs> very, very, very mean and, and living a, a, a stupid life. So mm-hmm. for me, the, the, the Quran and Islam has changed me mm-hmm. from night to day. So, and I mean, this reminds me of a point that many scholars say is that always, uh, constantly. Uh, you know, allow your tongue to do dhikrullah, mm, the remembrance mm. of Allah. And it, it relates to this because, for example, if you're practicing what the Qur'an says, then when you're about to go off track, the Qur'an will pull you back. Yes. In the same way, when you're, when you're constantly making dhikr, mm. when you're saying subhanallah, la ilaha illallah, when you're constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the time of death, it will be very easy on your tongue. Mm. It, has it won't to be, be a something habit. foreign. It won't be something foreign. Uh, sorry, what yeah. were you saying? It has to be a habit because if yeah. if you don't, this is something we talked about during one of the Gates of Goodness shows. It's about how um, it, it, you need to make it a habit, the dhikr of Allah, because it's not something that you think whenever the you know, medical mode comes, the <laughs> angel's death you're comes, you're going to be, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you're going to be in a state of, you know, uh, dismay and terror. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the thing and that confusion. you feel the thing that you feel most comfortable with, that's what's going to come. Some to your people mind. Mm. sing songs. Yeah. Some people do a lot of things because this is what they're used to doing. Yeah. They don't have the dhikr of Allah. They're not used to doing it. Yeah. Uh, so. Ilyas, I'm going to go to you just just before we go to Ilyas and get his thoughts on this. We're going to watch a short video clip, so stay tuned. <laughs> Subhanallah. 
statements we're about to show you are from the Holy Quran and is said to be the official, unchanged, pure word of God revealed over 1400 years ago. Claiming to be the word of God is a heavy statement and without proof or if a single contradiction is found within the book, the apparent word of God will be proven false. So without further ado, let's put the book to the test. In the 23rd chapter, titled The Believers, from the 12th to the 14th verses, God is said to give a detailed description of how the human being is formed. It begins by saying, We then placed him as a sperm drop in a place of settlement, firmly fixed. Then we made the drop into a alaqa. We will translate this word very soon. And then we changed the alaqa into a lump. Then we made out of that lump into bones and then we clothed the bones with flesh then we caused him to grow and come into being and attain the definitive human form in the 21st century we can now safely say that this verse is clearly describing the process of human development in correct chronological order however what we should be paying attention to in particular is the second stage referring to the development of the embryo the specific word used to describe the embryo in this verse is the word alaqa. The word alaqa, when translated into English, can mean three separate things. Firstly, a blood clot or to be suspended, that is to be hanging or clinging to something. Or thirdly and finally, a leech. Now, all three definitions don't come anywhere near what we perceive to be the human embryo. So why are these words used and what significance do they share with the human embryo? Can the embryo be described as a blood clot? Well, what do you think? In the third week of embryonic development, a tubular heart joins with the blood vessels to form a primordial cardiovascular system. And by the end of the third week, the blood is circulating and the heart begins to beat on day 21. The first thing that comes to mind in regards to being suspended or hanging is the umbilical cord. But we can't use that example because we are simply referring to step two, before the baby has even formed. But we now know today that the umbilical cord is formed from the connecting stalk. And the connecting stalk is formed as soon as the embryo is formed. The embryo's connecting stalk has even been described by John Allen and Beverly Kramer as an object to suspend the developing embryo in the extra embryonic column. So an embryo is suspended and does have a strong resemblance with a blood clot. What on earth would an embryo have to do with a leech? Figure A shows the structure of an embryo at 25 days. Figure B shows a leech. Now please note once again that the embryo in this greater than the size of a kernel of wheat. This is an x-ray of the embryo at 22 days. This is the internal structure of a leech. It's mind-blowing stuff, but you still haven't seen anything yet. This is the head of the embryo at 22 days. The detail you are seeing right now is absolutely impossible to be seen with the human eye and can only be seen with a microscope. This is the back end of a leech. There's no other words used to describe this other than mind blowing. The pictures we have shown you are impossible to be seen with the human eye or even to be predicted by the human mind. Once again, the verses we have shown you were revealed over 1400 years ago to a man who couldn't read nor write. Are these the words of God? Descriptions of the human embryo in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the 7th century. The only reasonable conclusion is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad from God. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed that short video clip. Now, uh, Elias, before the break, we were speaking about how the Quran has affected us uh, in terms of socially and in terms of ritualistically. And we said, obviously, we're supposed to uh, 
extract our social and our ritual, uh, uh, ritualistic worship from the Qur'an. Uh, and many times it's not done. So, I mean, it was a two-part question. The first one was, personally, do you use the Qur'an? And the second part is, why do you think people uh, don't extract their social life from the Qur'an? Um, first and foremost, me personally, do I... I mean, I try to do the best of my ability, and uh, I'm not perfect, um, but I, I try. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, like if an, if an issue arises, I don't, and I know that, okay, this is from the Quran, I do try to the best of my ability to, to follow it. Um, the second point, why is it not used? I think we touched on it earlier on, um, we don't understand the Quran mm. as in our communities, but also I, I just think that we don't approach the Qur'an in, the, in with the mindset that it's supposed to change us or we're supposed to behave in a certain way. We just use it as a, a book of, you know, sometimes we see it just a, as, a, as a book of rules. You know, I know so many times uh, when, you know, someone was having, uh, you know, marriage problems and they go and read the Qur'an to find out the ruling on divorce or, you know, but they don't just pick it up to take guidance from it in for life generally. You know, so I think I think that's a big issue, and I think um, socially we just take our social habits to be normal. It's just fine, you know. Like if I want to, um, you know, if I want to do something, that's just done. That's just something that's done just socially. Just like for example, for, for example, in, in in the UK, you know, people may swear. And it's just common. I don't know what it's like in uh, Arabic countries, but you know, swearing is just part of day-to-day -day life. You British people it's swear a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and Americans as well. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just part of our culture, yes. isn't it? But the Quran has, has changed that for me. I ain't going to do that no more. Yeah. Whereas I think that in Muslim countries, maybe we do things and we don't really question why. Yeah. You know, for example, uh, uh, hijab. Culturally, a lot of Muslims wear it, and they don't, even and they don't know it. why they they wear. Why they don't know why? I'm not saying that you know no one knows, but in, no, it's it's yeah. not uncommon to find someone wearing a hijab or no, no and, and, and they don't know why. And um, when the culture is on them, okay, don't wear this hijab, mm -hmm. then they'll just they'll take off without feeling that they're doing something that Allah told them mm -hmm. not to. You know, so you have so many stories, you know, someone leaves their house in hijab and their parents think they're wearing it. As soon as they turn the corner, you no, know, change that Superman, it's like, just <laughs> change it quick and when they go back in, they put it back on again. So I think that sometimes, without knowing, sometimes we put our culture above our Islamic identity. Mm. And I think that's why, you know, we don't apply those issues in the Quran. For example, you know, we in, or in London or in UK and we're talking about hijrah you know I want to go to, <laughs> I want to, go to a Muslim country and people are Muslims and you know <coughs> it's going to be an Islamic life and X, Y and Z and when they get there they're disappointed because they don't they don't find what they were looking for because maybe that person has really tried to take on the Quran fully in their lives okay the Quran yeah. says this I'm going to do this and then when they go to that Muslim country they find that people are just living culturally and it's very hard for them to make that transition. So I believe that one of the main reasons why we don't implement the Qur'an in our social lives is because without knowing, we kind of just make the Qur'an a book of reading when we want to do an act of worship rather than an actual guide uh, for our lives. I mean, maybe just put cultural practices uh, 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 ahead of it or above it. Okay, so just take... Uh, you want to say something? Just a really quick point is that I think a key point is that uh, first of all, understanding the Quran is what will help you, uh, you know, be able to implement it. But also, that that big change that people go through w whenever you start doing things, you know, instinctively, that goes with the Quran. Yeah. This, this is the big change because we're every, we all have time to sit down and think. Okay, let's sit down and okay, what do I want to do? You, you, if you're you know, a decent person, you're going to follow. Well, okay, I'm going to try to do my best with the Quran says. You, you're going to try. Okay. But when something happens, like for instance, and somebody, you know, steps on your foot, yeah. what? How do you react? This is where the real test comes in because this is showing whether or not the Quran has really affected you. Because if you're still reacting the same way that you reacted before, then it really hasn't affected you because it needs to change you. You change your adab, your akhlaq. This is part part of the tarbiyah. 
This is what the Sahaba went through, you know. They were rough and tough. <laughs> so rough. They were, you know, like Bedouins, like. And then after the Islam changed them, then the Bedouins came, they were accepting Islam. They couldn't take their behavior mm. when they used to be close to them. And they were like, Ya, ya Rasulullah, help us. Wait, wait. These people were driving us crazy. And they, they told them to be patient because they were, they were going through the tarbiyah that you, did, you went through already. Mm. They went through a change. So this is the, the, the big thing for me is that we need to try to make it to where it's not something you have to always have time to think about. It needs to change you internally to where you react following what the Quran is. And uh, just to give an example of uh, what you're saying there is that uh, I remember a story at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu life, just to cut it short, uh, not to get into too much detail because we're going to go for a short break. Um, <clears throat> before, uh, in the Arab culture at that time, it was very normal for when they spoke to each other to touch each other's beards. Yeah. And um, one time they were negotiating the Prophet Sallallahu and a person that was not a Muslim at that time. Yeah. Uh, and he was touching the Prophet Sallallahu beard and the companions got up. You know, <laughs> what's raising. going on? But even though this was normal in their culture, but because of that tarbiyah, because of spending time, and they held the Prophet ﷺ in, in such a manner, you know, hi, this is the Prophet ﷺ, we don't do this to the Prophet ﷺ, but they knew that tarbiyah changed them. Yes. So what was normal for them before became something, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And they didn't have to think about it, exactly. like sit down and contemplate natural it. Reaction. It became natural for them to follow this, you know, this Qur'an and so Okay, so what we want to get into next is how we can approach the Qur'an in a way that it can, it can speak to us directly, in a way, in a way that it can appeal to us and that we can start you know, taking our day-to-day -day social life from the Qur'an. Uh, before that, we're going to go for a short break, so stay with us. As soon as we come back, we will get into these questions. Stay tuned. How perfect my is and her praise Through the powerfully vivid, spiritually uplifting, heart-softening, life-changing, soul-transforming descriptions of life after death, we reminded ourselves about the barrier that is placed. So once you leave this world, a barrier is placed behind you, and you are prevented from coming back to this life. Those two rak'ahs that you used to pray, you used to take for granted. After you leave this world, there's a barrier. The journey of the soul through the stages of the day of resurrection and the explicit descriptions of hellfire as well as the beautiful and spiritually uplifting descriptions of paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we did not create the heavens and the earth without purpose, without aim, without a reason. This is the assumption of those who disbelieve. So beware and low to those who disbelieve from the hell. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us immediately the example of the righteous people on the Day of Judgment. So He says, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No doubt, verily, the awliya of Allah, the friends of Allah, those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no fear on them, nor shall they grieve. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Qalu aji'tana li ta'fikana an alihatina fa'tina bima ta'iduna in kunta min ash-shaytanir Allah 
أخاف عليكم بعذاب يوم عظيم فيهما عينان نضاختان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان فيهما فاكهة ونخل ورمان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان بلاء بلاء فهل يهلك إلا القوم Sent from Allah to an angel then to man That man was Muhammad, the best of creation Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala Assalamu alaikum and welcome back from that short break. Now uh, we have a phone call joining us live. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I think I think uh, it's been cut off. Okay, uh, so before we went for that short break, we said we were going to discuss different ways in which a person can approach the Quran and uh, <laughs> in a way that it will appeal to him. So, Bilal, if you want to start us off, inshallah. Different ways to approach the Quran. Um, I think one thing that we have to do is establish a routine with the Quran. <coughs> I think it's too easy for us to kind of put it on the shelf, let it collect dust, and we get caught up in the hustle and bustle of our day. We have to set apart, set, set apart some time for that. Um, maybe before, after federal time, around that time is a very good time to read. Also, for those who are in their daily commute. Uh, whether it's a subway, monorail, bus, uh, I don't know. If you live in Egypt, a tuk-tuk, I don't know. But take the time to read the, the Quran, or at least listen to the recitation from your cell phone, MP3. Um, um, pay extra close attention on, on Fridays. Um, but that, <coughs> sorry, that would go for somebody who understands Arabic. What about the vast majority of Muslims who don't understand Arabic, how can they approach the Qur'an? And, you know, we can, we can advise them as, you know, non-native Arabic speakers. Uh, how can they approach the Qur'an in a way that they can start finding benefit from the Qur'an? Um, obviously, aside from reward, now, don't get me wrong, obviously there's benefit in reciting the Qur'an. We're trying to speak about how we can actually understand the Qur'an, or understand somewhat of the Qur'an, so we can extract our, our behavior from the Qur'an. You know, we, we do, generally, Muslim speaking, understand the basic rules in the Qur'an. Prayer, what's haram, what you can't eat. The general things we understand, but what about how we behave? That's what we want to focus on here. So, Bilal, as, as a non-native speaker, how do you think that you can advise others to extract benefit from Well, the I think those who have not yet found the opportunity to study and learn the Arabic language, um, as I know many people who are in that situation, they usually carry uh, a companion, um, Arabic, English, um, Quran, or whatever their native language, language is. It could be Somali, and whatever the case may be, and apply the same techniques that I was talking about. But also, one of the things that I find very enjoyable is the study of the Arabic language. And I think the, the activity of studying these aspects of the religion keep you engaged with it. Right, because I, I, don't, I don't really know how possible it is for an individual to say, okay, I just became Muslim, I'm Muslim now, um, that's it. And they don't engage in any activity to draw them closer to religion, like, like in regards to learning Quran with someone who, who knows, studying the Arabic language. It's a connection to your community and your local area. Um, they help, because if you just say, okay, uh, I became Muslim on Monday, but uh, I went back to my old life on Tuesday, by Wednesday, you, there's a chance that you may not be Muslim again, or you'll just be somebody who's just Muslim in name. And that's, that's a real danger for a lot of people in a lot of communities around the United States and probably the UK as well, that you have to be, you have to, the, the way to stay connected to the, to, to the Quran is to also be connected to the people who, the people of the Quran, who study and read it also. Being around, keeping good uh, friends who will pull you into the desire to learn more and to study, those who are actively engaging in those activities. Because if you're just going to be in the same, the same lane as you were before, then, then there's no way you can get 
connected to the Quran. You know, so. Okay, <coughs> so um, I'm going to write two points from you, inshallah. I'm going to write the first one, which is try to keep a, some sort of translation to your language. So when you do recite your daily dose of Quran or your weekly dose, or whenever you recite Quran, you have at least a few ayahs that you can ponder upon, read their translation and try to understand it. And the second point I would, I'm going to write from you is that try to make an effort to learn Arabic. Yes. What, what, it's very understandable that not every single person is going to get the and one chance thing, one to thing. go to an Arabic institute, of course. And, and being connected to a community with people that are helping you to, be, to acclimate to um, Islam and to the Quran. Because, you know, you have people who, um, I've advised somebody before, somebody became Muslim taking a shahada over the phone. But the nearest masjid is like, uh, I don't like, 100 miles away. They can't go there. I've told people personally, listen, it may be a hardship, but you should think about moving to a community uh, uh, to, to that you can be close to other Muslims so that you can have access to study and learn and read and have a mentor. Because if you're just on an island by yourself mm. and with, with the same negative influences, this, this will have a negative effect on your iman and your learning. If, if the Quran is, if you're not making the, the if you're not a companion with, with the, 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 the Quran and the people, you know, to the, to the Muslims, then it's going to be very hard for you to, to maintain a connection. Mm. Okay, so, <clears throat> so obviously making an effort to learn Arabic, and we said that not every single person is going to get the opportunity to go to an Arabic institute, to go mm -hmm. to an Arab country to study Arabic. However, you can make somewhat of an, uh, of an effort in your local community, find out maybe there's some classes, or maybe even self-study. There's many online institutes and many online programs for you to start you know, studying. The, the important thing is to take the initiative and begin studying. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned was to establish an access to Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now this in general is very important obviously because the Prophet ﷺ has emphasized to, cre uh, to you know, keep yourself in good company. It's very important for you to keep good company. So if you surround yourself by Muslims, if you're going to the masjid five times a day, regardless where you're living, you'll have this daily, you know, you're meeting Muslims, you'll see people reading Quran, you might sit down, okay, there's a five minute speech, let me sit down, let's see what he's talking about, you learn something here, you learn something there, it's that, it's that, uh, it's that, it's that companionship that you're creating. And, and obviously, like Bilal said, not everybody lives near a masjid, not everybody lives near an Islamic center, not everybody has access to scholars, not everybody has access, but now, you need to make decisions, okay, can I move closer to where there's a masjid? Mm -hmm. You know, the, many times people don't realize, they, when they look for a house, especially in the West, the last thing that comes to their mind is, let's see where the masjid is located. Mm -hmm. That should be the first thing. How far is this from an Islamic school? How far is this from a masjid? You know, when you're with the realtor, all right, what's the nearest mosque to you? What's the nearest mosque to this location? That's, that's a very important part of choosing mm -hmm. your house. How close is it to the masjid? Mm -hmm. uh, Umar, I'm going to go over to you, inshallah. What's mm -hmm. your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts are that we follow the footsteps of the companions when they approach the Quran, which is maybe completely different from our way. Mm -hmm. We maybe focus not only on, like I said before, reading without understanding sometimes, but sometimes we focus on memorization, which is very important, but we make it a priority. As I want to finish so fast, and I don't focus on something which the companion di did do, which is <coughs> that they used to understand only 10 verses, and to apply them, and after that they go to next 10 verses. What if we did this? I think we're going to change the, the whole environment. Why? Because now, <coughs> as you said in the beginning, the action is the most important thing. Mm. Not only that I can speak and tell people that I'm, uh, Islam says this and so and so and so and so. Mm. So this is, maybe that's why the companions are th the best people who, uh, after the prophets. Why? Because mm. they, they did this approach. Not that we want to understand every single thing. Mm. Maybe we're going to overwhelm ourselves also. Mm. And this is not practical. So I just understand these first ten, ten verses what Allah wants to tell me, mm -hmm. and I apply them. After I apply them, go to the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and that's, that's completely connected with the points that we mentioned before. For example, <coughs> if you have a translation of the Quran, you find something new, something that you didn't know about. Now, instead of just moving on to the next part and yes. pondering upon a different verse, what about applying this verse? You just moved on to it and just, get, okay, now that's new information. Apply it. Try your best to apply it, actually. Uh, Idris, I'm going to come over to you, inshallah. Uh, for me, I, I won't take a lot of time, but for me, I think the most practical way of this is, is, is sort of including what, what they said, but 
in my own way, I think, if you want to implement, uh, learn how to implement the Quran in your behavior and stuff, the best and most in, in, uh, important way is to read the seerah. Mm -hmm. If you want to know how to implement the Quran, look how Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam implemented the Quran in his behavior. Mm -hmm. If you imp if you mock, if you you know uh, follow his behavior, do what he did, you can't go wrong. So for me, mm -hmm. even if you don't understand the Quran, follow what he did. He's showing you what the Quran says, whether you understand it or not. You don't have to understand it. Just follow what he did. He's telling you what he's doing because from the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. It's why. So follow him, and whether you understand it or not, mm -hmm. you 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 you'll be a winner. So. Yeah. And and that's that's very important because many times you see. You see people saying, well, I don't, I don't, I've never heard of that in the Qur'an. Well, the sunnah is there. The sunnah tells you how the Prophet ﷺ applied that ruling yes. from the Qur'an. That's what the sunnah is for. In many verses in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the Prophet ﷺ was sent to clarify the Qur'an. He was sent to explain the Qur'an. There are words in the Qur'an, such as salah, how do we know how to pray? From mm. the Prophet ﷺ, he showed us how to pray. Uh, Ilyas, inshallah, your opinions on this. Um, I would say... One of the best ways we can implement the Quran in our lives is really to try to recreate the the iman rush. I mean, for example, when I first accepted Islam, I mean, if the Quran told me to, you know, set my hair on fire, I would have done it. You know, because you just have that point where it's <laughs> true. You just you have that point where Islam is everything. You know, being a good Muslim is everything to you. And, you know, maybe years down the line you don't have that feeling anymore. I wish I still had it. You know, I wish I still had it. I don't, I don't have that anymore, you know. So I would say really we just need to try to nurture the Iman that we have and always uh, never take it for granted because you don't realize the value of it until it's gone or until it's you know, lacking something that it had before. Secondly, I would like to add uh, so one of the best ways to read the Qur'an is reading a book other than the Qur'an. You know, in t for example, we're talking about uh, manners and social behavior. For example, a book like Riyadh al-Salihin, mm. which is, I just think that book's amazing from your actions of your heart, in terms of actual haram actions, halal actions, rewards for this and that. It's an encyclopedia of, you know, manners, essentially. Mm. So a book like that, or a book that really just clarifies on how to do something. You know, Dries mentioned, um, you know, what, how do you act if someone steps on your foot? Mm. So... You know, you're going to have a chapter in Riyadh Salihin that focuses on anger. You know, and Qur'an ikayat and a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So I think selected reading on books about the Qur'an is also a good way of approaching the Qur'an in a different mindset. Because you may have a book on, for example, tafsir that explains a whole surah. You know, but then, so the next time maybe you read or hear that surah, you'll approach it differently. Could you understand slightly more about what's being said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, you know, for me personally, those are two, two, uh, two key factors. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the first point that you mentioned, I think, I think that's a point that many of us have lost, which is complete obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many times you find a command from the Quran or from the Sunnah of the Prophet and you say, well, that doesn't completely make sense to me. Or I don't agree with that. But when you... When you when you hear something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the Prophet sallam, and you obey it, whether it makes sense to you or not, and you constantly do this, this creates that iman rush. This creates that, you know what, you're ready to do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to do, whether or not it makes sense to you or not. Because your understanding is confined by the walls that you created. Mm -hmm. it's, it's confined by the society that surrounds you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what's best, uh, what's best for you. He knows better than society. He knows better than... Even your parents can tell you. Your parents obviously want the best for you, the, the, to the best of their ability. And imagine Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanting the best for you to the best of His ability. You know, uh, the other, the last thing I want to comment on is the last point that you mentioned was reading other materials. I think this is very important about reading materials that explain, or actually we can say that give you some sort of a visual of, of how to apply these rules that are mentioned in the Quran. Because books like Riyadh Salihin, for example, when it covers anger, it would have, you know. It was different stories and situations, and then they'll give you ayats and hadith of the Prophet ﷺ telling you, you know, 
Well, it's, you're not supposed to get angry like this. You're supposed to control your anger. So it will explain and clarify and help you visualize uh, the commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, through the Quran and through His Prophet uh, With that being said, this brings us to the end of the episode. So I want to thank uh, all of you guys here for giving us this wonderful conversation here today. Uh, dear viewers, I want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Let's Talk. We hope to see you on many more episodes. Don't forget to call in on any of our episodes and join our conversation. And until then, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.